This is David Dubal, and it's always a pleasure to be discussing music with the wonderful pianist Barbara Nisman. Why is it wonderful? Because she has the passion. She loves to talk about the piano, the composer she loves, the career, and she has a wonderful career. And mostly, I think, though, it's that enthusiasm. Barbara Nisman has come to the halls of WNCN to talk to me, and we're going to be listening to her in a list program and Hinastera. And Hinastera, of course, is a composer. We have heard her play often, and she is associated with him, and we're going to be talking about that in a second because you play, Barbara, the whole living repertory from Chopin Etudes to Prokofiev, and you must know by now, because you've made records and you've premiered the third sonata of uh, Hinastera, that you can easily get typecast. Am I right? Oh, yes, um, because people just assume when they hear you associated with one composer that that's all you play. And, and in my case, it it happens not to be true, except I, I really love the music of Hinastera because it's so pianistic. It's the same list, Prokofiev piano tradition, and, yes. uh, and it's a joy to, to study and perform. Hinastera was not really a pianist. How did he have that tradition in him so? Because the, this, the stuff, so to speak, of his piano music lies in the hands of as the Liszt, Prokofiev, Ravel tradition, yes. Well, we don't know him as a pianist, but I remember once he confessed to me of having studied, and then he said, you know, I play my sonata, he said, but one chord per second, which is very funny because, of course, it's marked very uh, allegro, very fast. But he has this, um, he had this wonderful instinct for no matter what instrument he wrote for, whether he was writing a harp concerto or mm-hmm. a violin yeah, concerto. Yeah. And he said... That's the mark of a good composer, to be able to write for the instrument, to really be able to even write for the things the instrumentalist thinks the instrument can't do, mm. which he How really How does this expanded. happen in some composers and some not? I mean, even as great as ma- a master as Schumann, my God, it's not comfortable to play some of his music and even Brahms, and yet there are those that are just are born to, um, to understand instruments as Berlioz understood the whole orchestra. That's right. And it makes it, I must say, for a pianist, it's a joy. It makes it so much easier when you're working on something and then to master it, and you see how it fits and how mm-hmm. mm. how it works. Bach had it too. That's right. Cerebrally and well is the coordination between the hands. Scarlatti had it. Liszt, Liszt had, had it, it to the highest degree mm-hmm. of anyone in the history of the world. Uh, I, I've often said he composed for a universal hand. It just seemed that any hand would make it work if if you just had the means to do it. Uh, Chopin had it, but Brahms didn't, and Beethoven in many ways didn't. That's right. These are great well, it was a larger conception. Is right? it a separate ability, you think? Well, I, I think it's taken as part of the craft, the composer's craft, uh, but with with Hinastera, it, it just fit right into his whole musical language, mm-hmm. no matter what instrument he was writing for. Mm. Well, he had it, and it's hard to believe that Hinastera, who was talked about constantly, his operas, his piano music, he, that he's gone, that he's dead. It was when? Uh, it was suddenly in 1983, and uh, he had, at that time, at least 20 commissions that were waiting to be finished. Uh, I was fortunate that my sonata turned out to be his, his last work he ever composed. But uh, That's right. I want to say that you just mentioned something so interesting, your sonata. How many people could say such a thing? That sonata, the third sonata by Hines Dera, Argentine master, was composed for you. In fact, we edited it over the telephone, transatlantic. He was in a hospital bed, and uh, he sent me the score page by page, you know, uh, uh, sections. And um, then we would discuss pianistically what he didn't write in, what, what we would want. And, uh, yeah, it was an experience. It really was. And now, of course, every time I play it, it's, it's a real joy to perform. Yes. Well, that is something really wonderful. The Third Piano Sonata, his final work prior to his death in 1983, mm-hmm. was dedicated to you. It was supposed to have been a, originally a piano concerto. You know that story? I we don't were know. we were rehearsing his piano concerto uh, for his 60th anniversary concert in, in, with a Swiss Roman in Switzerland. And the first rehearsal, because the score is so difficult, was just percussion, 
piano and conductor. Mm -hmm. I think the harp too. Mm -hmm. And Hinister was in the audience and, and we went through it and it sounded terrific even without the orchestra. And mm -hmm. he said, ah, that's going to be my next concerto. Piano percussion mm -hmm. and orchestra. And he says, and it's going to be for you. So that's how the original mm. idea of, of the composition came about. And then of course he kept getting busier with commissions. Which and he was notoriously late with his he works. Was, he was a slow writer. He mm -hmm. said to orchestrate a measure used to take him a day, he would tell me. He said, I can't, he said, I can conceive of it, but then to put it down on paper it takes me. So you see, so it's long. interesting. Here he had this wonderful gift of understanding the instruments, and yet his facility wasn't fast. It was this slow working craftsman. And I think that's a compliment to him, mm -hmm. definitely. Yes, you know why Hinastera's work has a uniformity of excellence. That's right, and, and, I, and it always holds together. I mean, you, you understand what he was getting at yeah. and what he was tr doing. And sometimes the music, w even at its most difficult, by the third listening, he will make that form, the formal arc of the piece, be understood to the listener. There has been very few composers as um, difficult in many ways, but so accessible to the large audience. That's right. I would put on, let's say, the harp concerto on as part of our daily programming. Instantly we would have calls, even though it's a rather difficult piece. What is that? I must buy that. <laughs> and I think he had uh, this communicative uh, quality. But I'm just, of course, stunned with the fact that that was his last work, and mm -hmm. it, it turned out to be a very small sonata. Right, because originally uh, he had said after we I played it for him, he said, I want to write an adagio introduction and mm -hmm. to... Um, introduce the work because he wrote it in the form of a Scarlatti sonata. Yeah. So it's a binary structure. It's two parts with a coda, a virtuosa coda. Mm -hmm. And that was you know, in the cards, except, of course, uh, he didn't have time to complete it. Well, our engineer, Vito Colonna, wants very much to hear it. He's quite ready to put it on, and I want to hear it. And you're ready. And our audience will now hear Barbara Nisman in the last work of Alberto Hinastera, the third piano sonata. Thank you.
Piano Sonata number no. three, Inestera, artist, my guest, Barbara Nisman, the work composed for her. Quite wonderful. Uh, this is not recorded yet on a label, but we will be hearing from your Desto labels very shortly. Now, what shall we talk about that will be titillating and interesting to our audience? Shall we say that the world is in bad shape? As it's it, true. <laughs> it's true, and I don't know why it is. I mean, we should all be able to figure it out by now. Better to make music instead. <laughs> yes. Now, why, why don't people buy pianos and practice all day? Have you ever thought of that? There'd be no war. But it takes a little bit of talent <laughs> to do that. Forget and talent. Money. <laughs> I think everyone loves music. I think there should be free piano teaching, violin teaching. Worldwide, It should be part of the government. Why should they be making bombs? Why should not every single person get a fellowship if they want to think for two years, as Buckminster Fuller once said? Why should we not give this person a chance to just discover something new and wonderful for the human race? Why does it always have to be this thing called working? After all, there are thousands of buildings, he said, on 6th Avenue where we can home people, put them up, Right? <laughs> Why should we have to have them on the street? Well, I'd love to be able to just sit and play the piano all day. And that's I know. I like to do that. And that's why I'm talking about oh. it. Some of these wonderful ideas don't work, they say. Well, I keep, you know, occasionally presenting them, and people look at me and they say, well, it would be wonderful, but it will never happen. And I say, well, why won't it happen? They say human nature. I said, I don't really believe in human nature, Barbara. For if I believed in human nature, everything would be bad because everyone says, no, you can't do that, that's human nature. No, you can't do that, that's human nature. Well, I think human nature is a real terrible phrase. We've pushed through human nature constantly. Once we were very cruel to animals. Once people were executed in Rome right outside, you could come and Lord Byron's writing a, a letter to a friend back in England and he just said, I just saw a public execution. We don't do that now. So we improve on a thousand things, don't we? But that brings me to the idea of, do we improve artistically? Does the world produce better pianists or violinists? Well, we can say that the technique probably of our young artists is uh, better, more brilliant, faster than ever before. They win. We can see from all the competitions. I would, if I had my way, I'd go back to, <laughs> to people like Rachmaninoff and, and uh, even People whom I call now our old core pianist, Svyatoslav Richter, because he's, mm. he's no longer considered a young Russian pianist. You know, he's like, <laughs> well, he's 70. <laughs> but um, Time flies. You were talking about learning all the Prokofiev sonatas, and you're doing now that fantastic piece, the eighth sonata, which That's Richter right, himself, which I think, beauty. premiered. And uh, you heard Richter play, and you were astounded again. Yes, uh... In fact, it, it made me realize once again, because I hadn't heard the recording in such a long time, what a great pianist he, he is. Mm -hmm. And too bad we don't get to hear him more often. And why hasn't he come here 
I have written him a letter. I don't know if it ever got there. Probably didn't. <laughs> to dear Sviatoslav, I miss your playing. Why don't you come to Carnegie Hall? No answer. Well, what can I do? <laughs> if only it were that easy, David. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I don't understand why there should be barriers and what does countries have to do with, you know, artists playing music? Mm. Mm. It's ridiculous. Well, what is not ridiculous is the fact that coming up next year is the 100th anniversary of the death of one of the most titanic forces in the history of music, still not understood enough. And that is, well, he's the father of us all. I say he is the father of the piano, not Clementi. He's the father of the career. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is look at Alan Walker's book to see how he opened Europe up single-handed in his stagecoach and his 360 cravats and his 60 uh, suits of clothing and his magnificent medals and his flamboyance and his ability to have the strength, literally, to travel thousands of miles a year in the most amazing conditions. And that is, of course, Franz Liszt, probably the greatest pianist and certainly the greatest pianistic mind that ever lived. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Tell yes. me a little of how you feel about him. Well, I adore his music. I mean, I, I would second everything you say. In fact, I always think, uh, I always joke with myself, it's a pity I was born 100 years too late, so I couldn't have been one of his uh, piano students when he was giving all those master classes for um, all the talented mm. European pianists. But he did more for, for music making than anyone else, except I agree with you. So often today when you program a work by list, um, the audience uh, does what they used to do with Tchaikovsky's music, or what they still do with Tchaikovsky's music. You know, it it's um, not given its due. And mm. then you hear a work like the Lissonata, which is really one of the great masterpieces of the entire literature. And um, you wonder. But also th I think there's a danger in perhaps musical taste, the way list is played these days. It's so easy to walk you know, cross over that fine line of within good taste and making it mm -hmm. um, virtuosic uh, fireworks uh, show off. And pianism. yet you have to be reckless enough to show that kind of, you know, he didn't apologize even for his vulgarity. He was everything in his music. I think you have to have, you have to play a list with passion. I, I think that probably sums it up with you the right kind of passion, though. Well, you do. <laughs> you have that, oh, I would say that that no noble kind of passion, and we'll hear it now, by the way, in a performance that you like. Not everyone loves every piece that they record, and I know that you do care for this performance of the Spanish Rhapsody, and it was Liszt, of course, who opened up the, uh, the whole Iberian Peninsula to piano playing in the early 1840s. Nobody had heard piano recitals. In fact, he was the inventor, right? He said, the concert is me. That's right. And he had this wonderful profile, and I think that's why he put the piano sideways. Well, why not? <gasps> he, he said, I show what I must. <laughs> and he then uh, played the, well, I could just hear him and see him right now playing the uh, Spanish Rhapsody. Not his Hungarian Rhapsody. This is the Spanish, much less known. That's and right. And I love your performance, which I know when you once played at WNCN Live. And we're going to hear your recording, which is on Desto, isn't it? Or it, it is a it is soon to be released also on the Desto label. Mm -hmm. Originally recorded in Europe. Well, we'll all go over to Tower Records to get it soon as we hear this performance. Barbara Nisman, the pianist. <laughs> Thank you. 
Spanish Rhapsody. And I would say that's a difficult piece. And it's by Franz Liszt. And it was played by my guest Barbara Nisman, who was going to hang around and wait to talk some more with me about her career and Liszt and anything else right after this message. This is David Duval, and my guest is Barbara Nisman. And, well, you know, after Eugene Ormandy heard a performance of yours, he was very impressed and helped you, and you started your career really not in the United States, although you studied at uh, the University of Michigan with George Shandor, who I know well, who has been sitting, who has sat in that seat. And um, you played everywhere in Europe. How come it happened there for you and not here? Now you're beginning your American career, it seems. Well, it kind of snowballed, David. I remember it was my first trip to Europe and my first concert in Europe. It, it was everything at once. And uh, I made my debut in, in major cities, and then I was immediately reengaged with orchestras. And, for instance, in a country like Holland. Well, you're loved in Holland. That's right. Well, this little country the size of Kentucky uh -huh. has 21 orchestras. So for a young artist, it was wonderful. I mean, you could tour with one concerto, play it five times, really learn a concerto, put it in your repertoire. And the performance opportunities were wonderful, and I loved living there mm. and uh, traveling. And then... A few years ago, I decided, well, you're an American. It's time for you <laughs> to at least um, come Well, it's home. not like you haven't played here. I, I mean, you have played with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Pittsburgh, the Minnesota, the Boston Pops. Um, and David Zinman, you have... I yes. never heard him conduct until recently at the Mostly Mozart. This is a very natural conductor, oh, isn't and he's he? He's a wonderful accompanist. He yeah. really is. Uh -huh. We worked together for the first time in Holland and in England. You know, conductors are not always good accompanists, especially these days. Mm, that's They're true. They're not like the Fritz Reiners around every day, you know. Um, tell me, what has been your most insane experience playing in this country? Is there any, or is it usually fairly regular? You mean insane Just, in what way? I don't know that you well, I'll know. I'll tell you, it wasn't in this country. The snow fell in, into the stage once happened to me. Do you want to hear a wonderfully insane Rachmaninoff story? Love to. <laughs> but it, it took place in Trondheim, Norway. I, mm -hmm. I was, uh, and that's way up north. And I thought I was coming there to perform Rachmaninoff Third because I was doing oh it my God, in... Oh, you play that finger buster? Yes, oh. that wonderful concerto. I, I was doing it a, a few weeks later on tour, and I thought, wonderful, I'll try it out in Norway. And uh, I get off the plane, and I'm met. You know, the man has the program with my picture on it. And he, he says, oh, we must go immediately to rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, they're practicing your concerto. And he starts humming a few bars. And I said, that's the Rachmaninoff second. He says, yes, that's the concerto oh we're doing. Oh, God. And, you, of and, course and I had just done the Rachmaninoff Paganini, so I said, well, I'll do the Paganini or the third. And we got to rehearsal, and they, they gave me a score because, of course, they weren't going to change the Rachmaninoff third. And I had one night to... Relearn, of course, relearn the concerto. But what if but you didn't know it? Well, I have, every pianist knows the Rachmaninoff second, but I hadn't played it for. A there are thousands <laughs> that can't bear it. <laughs> oh well, I love the piece. So anyway, I, I do too. But I that stayed up in practice. Oh no! And then the, the next day, you're gonna, going to laugh. This could only happen in Norway. The next day, I made the front page, and it said, "Pianist is good sport. She plays the Rachmaninoff second. <laughs> No, it's more than a good sport. <gasps> Think of the fact that you had to learn that one day. Somewhere you were practicing that piece, and it, it happened that you could do it. Think of it, though. There are um, there are s really so few concertos in a way. Now, you know, we're, we're uh, at the time in the late 20th century where there's no new additions. People don't really, in orchestras, big-name orchestras, don't play... Reinberger's piano concerto as good as it is or Anton Rubinstein's fifth or whatever. Well, let's take a look. There's the Tchaikovsky, and so I'm sure you play that, right? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. You have to as a, as a woman that plays with many orchestras, um, but nobody does number two, mm -hmm. very few. Then there's the five Beethoven. Right. I'm sure you play one of those at oh, least. Oh, no, I play all of them. You see? Uh, interesting. Right. Yeah, what well, interesting. I play all the basic repertoire. All. Uh, yeah, so I you mean, just have learned, learned, learned. But, but you see that, I must say that that I learned it when I was a young student, and now the joy is in relearning. Mm. And uh, I I got all the big repertoire then. I mean, I remember learning the Hammerklavier when I was that was my graduation recital, and 
it's wonderful to retackle it now. Uh, um, the hammer it's clavier when you were just in your you know little girl really. Well, I wasn't a little girl. <laughs> yes, I graduated from college. Now, actually, you but started studying with. Uh, George Shandor at the University of Michigan when you were 16. That's right. I, I went there as a, as a freshman, and I stayed there for seven years. Well, you received the university's highest musical honor, which is the Stanley Medal. See, I have all my information. Oh. You loved the place enough to stay and honor it with you getting a doctorate from there. Right. You received the first humanities recipient of the coveted Athena Award. And you know that Athena was the goddess of wisdom. And that's presented annually. So you see, I, well, you know I didn't memorize this. I have this thing in <laughs> front of me. Um, what's one of the great orchestras you've played with? The one that has a, I don't know, a certain color that you could never forget. Because I know that each performance, mm. you seem to remember each one very vividly. Oh, I'd have to say. And then... Uh, well, I'm a hometown girl anyway, but I would immediately say the Philadelphia Orchestra because it's a special orchestra to play with. And I remember, I mean, I grew up with that orchestra. I didn't know you were born in Philadelphia. Yes, born mm -hmm. and raised there, and it was always a dream to play with that orchestra. So when I played for Eugene Normandy when I was a student, I mean, that was like a Cinderella story. Mm. My goodness, that is indeed. Now, have you been disappointed with picking it's such an arduous career, and of course, being a woman, there are just not as many of the big careers, women, as men. Why? Who knows? I think that you know it's a difficult uh, situation to discuss. But it seems that for every woman, there's five mm -hmm. or ten men. Have you found prejudice as a woman? Making oh, the career? Well, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I, I always laugh when somebody will come backstage after a concert and say, gosh, for a woman, you really are strong. Well, these are, like these are the I mean, things these are the that, that, well, things, this, this hurts, though, eventually. Uh, no, I just think it's uh, people don't expect, uh, or people, uh, let me say it another way, people don't realize that to play the piano, it doesn't take the strength of a Tarzan. I mean, all you really piano playing is just coordination even even young pianists today uh, it, it still has to be learned that it, you don't have to be you know six feet tall to, to be a Prokofiev player uh, a five foot 80 pounder can make a great sound <laughs> if they right. know how exactly that's the point yeah. and uh, I know that you studied those years with uh, Shandor a Hungarian born pianist who studied with Bartok mm -hmm. who was incredible uh, a pianist also um, he really got into the playing aspect of the piano. He said that he could play three concertos straight without ever tiring, mm -hmm. and you agree with that, don't oh, you? Oh, I do, because uh, one thing about his teaching, which was so wonderful, was that uh, there were no mysteries about piano playing. It wasn't like, uh, to master this difficult passage, just go home and practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was re everything was analyzed. And when I came to him, I was just an instinctive pianist. I just played. Mm -hmm. I mean, who... Like I didn't most even, people yes, always. Yes, exactly. I mean, I never stopped to think of how to play octaves. I just play them to a certain point. And mm -hmm. that, when you don't analyze, you can only go to a certain point. Then if you have problems, you don't know how to um, cope with them. Well, that's usually the uh, uh, pro problem of a prodigy. You yeah. know, once you start analyzing, then it falls apart. Yeah. So he was able to really dissect, you know, a analyze every aspect about piano How did playing. he learn to do such a thing? He said... He told me Bartok didn't teach him that's that That's right. And he said when he had problems himself, he had to... Figure it out. Yeah, because there was nobody else to figure them out. So, uh, it, for me, it was wonderful to have those years. And we started with the Chopin etudes. I remember that was really my uh, technical exercises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we analyzed everyone and went through them. Mm. Interesting. Well, we're going to hear you again on the uh, record, the All Hinesterra record, and I would love to hear the three Argentina dances, those early works, Opus 2. He was just like 19 or so, That's right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little about it, because that middle one really is his mm -hmm. hit piece in a way, isn't Actually, it? the middle one. Somebody should make a popular song out of that. Yeah. That melody is wonderful. I, I would prefer nobody doing any <laughs> more popular songs in the history of the world. I am so sick of popular music. I was just joking. I know you were, <laughs> but, but I've got to put that out. I don't want to hear any popular music again in my life. I don't need it. 
Now I'm going crazy here in this because you know every elevator. I every there is no cable station anymore. I thought cable was supposed to be interesting. It's all that rock and roll. <laughs> I once liked it, but no more. Well, they, these these are like because they're really nice works. Please uh, keep uh, these pieces <laughs> without <laughs> no words. So uh, it is one of those fantastic. What is the name of it? Danza. Uh, Danza. Uh, well, the first one is the in in English is the um, dance of the old cowherd, and then Danza della Mosa Donosa, the dance of the sad maiden, and uh, the last one is Dance of the Clever Cowboy, which is typically Hinister. It's like any finale he's ever written with mm -hmm. those. Um, sharp accents and syncopations and that wonderful that, rhythm know, that it's keeps exciting. going. Yeah. And there's also in that piece a feeling of joyousness. Oh, absolutely. That really is a rarity. We're going to hear Barbara Nisman in the Opus 2 by Alberto Hinastera, 1916-1983. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, those three dances, Argentina, Selpus 2 by Hinastera are fantastic. That second one, of course, is luscious. But, you know, I love number three, that clever cowboy. And, you know, you bring out that joy, that that lustful joy. It's just so he's like uh, getting up in the morning looking at the pampas. That's right. Yes, it's fantastic. The artist on that Desto release, Barbara Nisman. We'll be right back and we will hear some more Franz Liszt. Barbara Nisman is my guest, and we've been talking on various subjects, one being Franz Liszt, whose birthday is coming up, that 100th birthday uh, of the death of this master in 1886, and you have recorded the Paganini Etudes, and I know that you love that that rather Scarlatti-ish one in E major, and we're going to hear that, and right after that, well, Vito wants to try to get that ready, and he so he wants me to talk to you for one minute now. Tell me about this piece in one second. You love it, that's for sure. But Yes, no. it's, it's because I guess secretly I always wished I were a violinist. <laughs> and when I play this piece, I feel like a violinist. <gasps> yes, it's so violinistic. And this one he translated rather simply yes, to the, right. from the violin original, which is by Paganini. And these are the 1851 versions he did. Uh, well, this is when Liszt was absolutely stunned early in his career when he heard Paganini play. And he said, my goodness, if he could do this on four strings, you know, I'm going to become the Paganini of the piano. And he did. And he started transcribing these pieces. And Vito seems to be ready with it. And so we will all be blessed with it. The E major Paganini list etude in the hands of Barbara Nisman. <laughs> major transcendental Paganini list etude in the hands of Barbara Nisman. And I want to go right on to that piece called The Bells. Not an etude, not a caprice of Paganini actually, but from the B minor uh, rondo, from the B minor violin concerto, which he translated to the piano. And uh, I think you like this performance of yours. Am I right? Well, we could, we could always like better the next performance, but I, I, I adore the piece. I love playing Campanella. Campanella and the artist Barbara Nisman. <laughs> Thank you. 
just heard La Campanella, the pianist Barbara Nisman, and she has been my guest, and I'm very pleased to have talked to you about your career. We have not pushed any of your concerts or events or records, although you can buy what you just heard on Desto, am I right? That's right. The Hinostera is, is released. The list will be released. Good. Um, I wish you the best of luck. I know that you are playing constantly this year, and it was good seeing you again. Oh, it was lovely to talk to you, David. This is David Duval. Thank you for listening.